Uh, so the obvious question is, what is the modernization toolkit about? Well, let's start with the obvious. The modernization toolkit helps us modernize Java applications. And by modernize, we're referring to changing Java applications to remove dependencies on libraries. And we're doing that because these libraries have become a source of technical debt. How can libraries become a source of technical debt? Well, typical examples would be if it's affecting the security of your application or the accessibility of your application or the maintainability. But there's many other examples of non-functional attributes that we can tie into the use of libraries. So if we can improve the non-functional attributes of our applications by changing the libraries and frameworks that our applications are using, that's great. If we can automate that process, it's even better. And that technically is what the modernization toolkit is achieving. But applications don't exist in a vacuum. There are stakeholders, stakeholders that each have a responsibility in keeping the application relevant. So the real challenge for organizations is, can we solve the technical debt of this application but not upset the system of stakeholders. So each retains their competence with performing their responsibilities. The webinar we have planned for you today is going to focus on the technical aspects of the modernization toolkit. If you're interested in learning more about the human aspect of software modernization and the modernization toolkit, be sure to check up our follow-up webinar Two weeks from now, two weeks from now, we've planned another webinar where we will be looking at the human aspect. So project management topics, stakeholder engagement with the modernization toolkit, and tips on going from a product to a project. Uh, these will all be discussed on December 4th, and we hope to see you joining again. The modernization toolkit is one product with features for both upgrading Vaadin 7 and 8 applications, and also for migrating Java desktop Swing applications. So if you're migrating from Swing to Vaadin, you know that you're doing more than just migrating from Swing to Vaadin. There's also a desktop to web element going on as well. So the second half of our webinar today is going to focus on these desktop elements and my colleague Daniele will be covering those. What we'll focus on together is uh, the components of the modernization toolkit. The modernization toolkit in general, then it's a product. So it's a product that requires a Vaadin subscription. It's got three components. The first component is an analyzer and you would run the analyzer before you would begin your modernization project. The second component is Dragonfly. That is the tool that does the automated refactoring of your sources, and you would use this when you're doing your modernization project. And the third element is the feature pack, and that extends the target flow features with features from the original libraries that you're migrating from. Feature pack will become a part of your application, and you will use it as long as you need it. The analyzer part is actually free and it's a pretty useful tool. Said simply, the analyzer quantifies the exposure of a Java application to a library. It uses the resolvers of the compiler to get the declaring class of each dependency found in your sources it gets the fully qualified name of each declaring class and tries to match that name with a pattern, a pattern text that you've specified when you started the tool. As we'll see, the patterns are arbitrary, so this is actually a very powerful tool. Uh, the analyzer it comes in two flavors. It comes as a Maven plugin, and it also comes as a Eclipse plugin. So there's two versions of it. Um, Obviously, if you don't have Maven, you can't use the Maven version of uh, the, the analyzer. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, take a look at the Eclipse uh, plugin. 
even if you have Maven, I would encourage you to look at the Eclipse uh, uh, plugin because uh, uh, for four reasons. One, it's, it's just much more user friendly to use because it has a nice graphical user interface that you can click through. You know, you can't make a typo if you're just using your mouse, uh, so that's easy. Uh, secondly, the Eclipse version, it makes it possible to analyze a project without changing it. So uh, if you're using the Maven plugin, you're going to have to change the POM XML of your project probably in order to specify a plugin repository. You don't need to do any of this if you're using the Eclipse plugin because you simply drop the plugin into Eclipse and you don't have to change uh, any aspect of uh, your project. So that might be uh, uh, reassuring. Another good reason to uh, consider Eclipse is that it allows you to make arbitrary compositions of the sources and the projects. So if you want to analyze together sources from various projects, you can just import these into a single workspace, and the analyzer is going to work on that workspace. And uh, a fourth reason for, I'm, I'm selling the Eclipse version very hard. So the fourth reason why I would encourage you to uh, check out the Eclipse version also, or at least consider it, uh, is that Eclipse has an incremental compiler built into it. So it's much more robust, uh, even if uh, your source code has a number of errors, the analyzer is going to be able to work correctly with those lines that do not have errors, and that's just uh, a lot easier. Uh, the analyzer is linked to Vaadin's fine-tuning service. We'll say a few words about that in a few minutes. But first, let's see the analyzer and how it works. So the way that you would work with the free analyzer is, well, uh, the first step would be to download it. Uh, the um, Eclipse plugin is available in the Eclipse marketplace, so you can just access it from there. And the Maven plugin is available in the Vaadin directory as an add-on. Once you've downloaded that and installed it, then you can run the analyzer locally in your own environment. You do not need to send any application sources to Vaadin, uh, the, so there's uh, no need to send any NDAs. The analyzer is going to connect to the Vaadin servers when it's running, but it's only to fetch the latest conversion table information from Dragonfly. Then once that runs, it's gonna generate a report. You can read it locally, and if you're interested and this is entirely up to you. If you uh, want to uh, discuss this with, with Vaadin, uh, you can take up contact with Vaadin and we can discuss with you the results and uh, the next steps. So step one, installing it, that's pretty easy. Um, you just uh, go to the uh, Eclipse Marketplace. Uh, what you're doing is looking for something called Vaadin Tools, so Vaadin slash tools. Uh, that's what you've got. And then once you've selected that, uh, you'll be able to find Dragonfly and the Modernization Toolkit Analyzer. Uh, you'll install it just like you install any uh, Eclipse uh, plugin. If you're using the Maven variant, then you can do this with uh, the Vaadin directory. Uh, so there's something called the Modernization Toolkit Analyzer. You'll find this on our directory, and you can follow the instructions out there. After you've installed it, you can run it. So uh, in Eclipse, it is very, very easy, very um, intuitive how to get to that. There'll be an option appearing in your menu. And once you've selected that from the menu, you will see uh, a little uh, dialog like this appear. Remember in the beginning when I started uh, talking about the analyzer, I said that this was all about pattern matching. Well, here's where you see the patterns appearing and there are default patterns uh, available for if you're modernizing a Vaadin or a Swing uh, application, or if you're trying to analyze a Vaadin or a Swing application. So uh, the default is Vaadin. Uh, most companies in our community are modernizing Vaadin applications. Uh, so that's the default. So basically all you need to do is press OK. Uh, but if you're going to analyze a Swing application, then you can take the Swing default, which is going to search for javax.swing, java.awt, and a few selected things that we often find uh, companies using uh, from the J Goodies or the NetBeans projects. Now, these are the default settings, and if you don't like the default settings, or if you want to change them, or if you want to add something to 
uh, the pattern string, you can totally do that. You can even uh, use it to analyze things that aren't even uh, Vaden or Swing. So you could, for example, if you had an SWT application and you wanted to use the analyzer to analyze uh, SWT, then you would enter something this in the pattern. So you'd get rid of the default settings and then put in uh, that instead. And uh, likewise, for any uh, Java project uh, that you might be having, uh, you can analyze it the same way. GWT, for example, you put com.google.gwt. If you had JavaFX, you could put in JavaFX. Yeah, sorry, JavaFX didn't really follow the naming convention there, but there it is. Uh, and GXT, then you do com.sensha. So all of these things uh, you could search on um, and uh, use the, uh, this pattern matching for your analyzer. All right, step three then is uh, you get a report. So the analyzer is going to present a report to you. Uh, if you're doing this in Maven, it's just going to be on your Maven command line. If you're in Eclipse, this will be in your uh, console. And uh, yeah, it makes a special console for you. And it's just a text-based uh, report. Uh, here you see a sample uh, report from a Vaden 8 application that has some Vaden 7 still left in it. So the analyzer will be able to tell how much uh, of the references are Vaden 7, how much of Vaden 8. Uh, you'll see the number of lines. You'll see in just uh, some general physical statistics. And then you'll see the breakdown of everything in your workspace according to uh, method invocations that can be resolved to types that match with the pattern. And the same thing for constructor invocations types. And uh, you'll see some statistics, some percentages for how uh, the, the rest of the modernization toolkit is going to fit with this particular application or this workspace that you just analyzed. So you'll see which classes from your application are transformable and the top ones by size and automation percent and uh, which are of the APIs that you've used in your project that have APIs that are 100% uh, convertible. And then we have a few interesting statistics here, like the number of lines of code that won't require any conversion when moving to VOD and Flow. This is interesting because, uh, well, obviously, we're, we're taking only those references that uh, we're aware of. Um, so uh, yeah, um, it's still the case if you're moving from Swing or from older versions of Vaden to the latest version of Vaden. Um, you know, Vaden Flow gives you uh, a, a lot of very good correspondence to uh, the the Java that you have in your application. Uh, certainly, any Java that's not related specifically to the UI, and that number could actually be quite high. So we include that there, and we also include a references. Uh, of the coverage. We give you an, in, an indication of those percentages of the references of these things that we've counted here, uh, which can be automatically transformed to Vaden Flow today or would be easy to implement. We've got a, uh, maybe I'd say a few more words about uh, these three things here, these three numbers. Uh, so these are method invocations, constructor invocations, and types. Um, let's first look at the method invocation. So we we'll see, yeah, this is actually what you would expect uh, it to be if the method is being called. Obviously, and this call appears in your uh, source code. Well, if that uh, method has been declared in a class that's in a Vaden uh, or, or, or Swing a library, then it's going to be counted, and otherwise it's going to be ignored. Uh, so if it's a method with or without an expression, uh, they'll be added. Similar for the constructors. So obviously constructors, you'll find them from new, but you'll also find them from super invocations from within uh, an uh, from within the constructor uh, body, uh, if it's extending uh, another class. And then of course the types and the types appear. Uh, there's many ways in which the types can appear in your source code. Uh, you can find it as a, a field declaration. Uh, you can find it in the extends or the implements uh, a clause of your uh, type declaration. Uh, in a method declaration, you'll have it uh, as the return type of that method or the throws type, or it might be a formal parameter. It could be a local variable and another uh, a number of other instances in which the, the type can appear. So we can do all of this because we're using the 
or we are trying to smartly use this, the compiler. We're getting information from the compiler about uh, how this source code is being mapped and how it's being compiled. Uh, so that means that it's actually quite robust, even if you're doing some uh, unusual things, like um, perhaps if you're not using Maven or Gradle, maybe you're using an Ant script, or you're using some something that uh, isn't actually a script at all. Perhaps you've just simply configured this within Eclipse. Um, the analyzer is going to be able to understand it. And the same thing for if you have perhaps some preprocessors that you're using, perhaps something like Lombok, or maybe you've made something uh, custom. If Eclipse can understand it, so if your compiler can understand it and can build your application, uh, then uh, the analyzer can understand it as well. So inside this report, towards the end, there's going to be a reference to something called a fine-tuning process. We'll say a few words about that. After you run the analyzer, you might see the statistics of the automation coverage percentage, and maybe you're a bit disappointed by that because it doesn't seem so high. Well, this is actually something that's perfectly normal because every application is unique. Your application is no different from that. It's also unique. So the modernization toolkit has been built with rules that we've selected from what we've been able to see statistically being used the most by our community. So what APIs we've seen used statistically by our community, we've implemented these uh, in the modernization toolkit. And your application might simply be different from uh, the typical application that we see used by the community. So uh, that's, uh, that's just a, a normal situation. That's the way it is. So Vaden offers a service called fine tuning that can add functionality to the modernization toolkit so it becomes a better fit for your application specifically. We can give you an offer to uh, do this fine tuning service if uh, you send the analyzer report to us with the full details. And then in the offer, we can give you guarantees about the expected coverage and uh, indications about uh, how long it would take us uh, to develop this. And uh, yeah, that's going to give a, a better uh, automation and a, a, a better result for your project uh, that we're happy to work with you to, uh, to achieve. All right. Uh, so after you run the analyzer, of course, what comes next is Dragonfly. So uh, what is new in Vaden 24.5 is that we're making Dragonfly available to subscribers for the first time. So subscribers can now run this tool themselves. Dragonfly is a specialized tool, and it's typically, well, until now, it's exclusively been used by uh, our team of Vaden experts. So it's been used internally at Vaden, and it has a lot of options and configurations. And what we've done with Vaden 24.5 and Dragonfly is uh, we've made a selection of rules that we call the default selection, and we've uh, also given a default configuration. Uh, and with this default selection and the default configuration, we've got something that we think should be safe for community subscribers to run themselves. Of course, you can always run this yourself. Um, we re recognize even uh, with these defaults, it's still a very specialized tool. So uh, you know, you, you might always benefit from uh, some collaboration with us. Um, but if you're interested in doing this yourself, it's it's now an option uh, to subscribers. So how Dragonfly works, it's very similar to the way that the analyzer works, and that makes sense because it's built on the same core uh, technology. So Dragonfly is available as a Eclipse plugin and also as a Maven plugin. You can download Dragonfly from the Eclipse marketplace or from uh, Vaden's Maven repository. Typically, you know, because the, the analyzer just reads your code, it doesn't change your code, but Dragonfly is actually going to change the code. So typically you would want to, you know, make a copy of your source code before uh, you run Dragonfly. You don't need to send the application sources to Vaden and uh, Dragonfly, just like with the analyzer, Dragonfly will connect to the Vaden servers, but this is only to fetch the latest rules that and, and configuration information that uh, we have available in our repository. So you can uh, run this 
it typically is very fast. So I would say we've seen running on a laptop, a million lines of code is going to take about 20 minutes. Um, if you're running this on some more powerful machines, uh, it's going to go uh, faster, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's going to take a while. It, it will be a batch process. And uh, when it's done, what you'll see is a, uh, a log. Uh, so there's a report that it generates. And also, yeah, your, your source code will, will indeed be changed. Um, because it's not 100% uh, coverage, um, there's going to be some work still to do with your project in order to finish that. So this is something that you can do by yourselves or you can reach out to Baden uh, to see about finishing this faster. How to install it? Well, it's just like installing uh, the analyzer. And if you install the analyzer, probably you install Dragonfly at the same time. So there you go, you already have it. So the next question is, how do you run it? And as we said, we tried to make this super simple uh, for community uh, subscribers to run by themselves. And we think we've pretty much succeeded in that. Uh, so there's a migration menu that appears. And uh, if you switch to Package Explorer, you have the option to either transform everything in the workspace from either Vaden Summary to Flow or from Swing to Flow, or uh, you can make a selection here within the Package Explorer and transform just that selection uh, to Vaden Flow. There's also some settings here. I mean, the default settings should normally be good, but there's some extra settings here for in case you have uh, specific code pages. So you might be having some uh, one byte code pages. Um, uh, you would be able to set that up here in the settings. Um, and that's pretty much the, the main reason why you'd use those, uh, those settings. What's the output? So the third part of that is, right, after it's run, you'll uh, see the output. So there is an output file. There's a, a log file. Actually, there's a number of log files that will appear uh, that say in great detail exactly everything that it's done. It will give you uh, timestamps. It will say how long it's taken to, how many milliseconds it's taken to process each file in your workspace, and say what uh, rules it's applied. And of course, it's also changed your source code. That's the whole idea. So here's an example of what uh, before and after looks like after we've run uh, Dragonfly on a Swing application. Uh, so you can look at this and say, well, did anything actually change? And uh, yes, things have actually changed, but it's hard to find. So let's um, highlight those changes for you so that it's obvious. Now, if it was hard for you originally to see what was actually changing, that is actually the whole idea and the whole philosophy behind uh, Dragonfly. We are deliberately trying to make this uh, easy for the developers to understand and uh, to continue understanding if they've been developing uh, or, or maintaining the application uh, beforehand. So uh, we take great care in uh, making sure that the maintainability is there uh, that the structure of the code is retained, that the number of Java files that you have in your project, uh, that's going to be the same. Um, your uh, spacing is going to be the same. The name of your variables is going to be the same. Uh, the comments are going to be the same. Uh, we tried very hard to uh, minimize the impact uh, that's actually taking place on your source code in order to make it easily digestible by your developers. <clears throat> And uh, when we present these to uh, our developers, or when we present these to developers who are actually maintaining these applications, we sometimes get uh, strange reactions. And they say, well, is, is that it? it? It looks just like a, a find and replace. Well, that's, that's actually a good sign when a developer says it looks like a find and replace and I could do this myself. That means that uh, they're confident in uh, looking at this output that they understand what's actually happening here and uh, that they have uh, the confidence to continue maintaining this application. And uh, that is actually uh, exactly the effect that we're going for. So if your compiler can build it, the analyzer can understand it. If the analyzer can understand it, then Dragonfly can change it. And if Dragonfly can't change it in a way that meets our strict maintainability criteria, then we introduce the feature pack. 
The feature pack is going to be what enables us to keep changes within the expressions in which they appear. With Vadin 24.5, we have made a simultaneous introduction of the feature pack for Vadin 24 and also Vadin 23. Uh, so we know that there are a lot of older Vaadin users who are restricted in the Java versions that they can migrate to, and they're not ready to make the leap to uh, Java 17 yet. So for these uh, developers uh, and for these uh, companies, uh, we also have uh, the feature back available for Vaadin 25, sorry, for Vaadin 23.5 uh, that's been released also. So you can move from uh, older versions of Vaadin to Vaadin 23 or to Vaadin 24. We've also, for the first time, introduced things for desktop, and Daniela is going to talk about that in just a few minutes, and uh, that is for uh, Vaadin 24.5. Feature Pack is the new home for classic components. So if you knew classic components uh, in the past, or if you're familiar with them, you will find uh, these familiar uh, classes. Uh, so um, classic components, they're not uh, dead. We're continuing to maintain classic components for any uh, company that's already using them. So if you're already a subscriber to classic components, uh, you're, you're safe and we'll continue to uh, maintain that for you. Uh, but any new customers uh, really should be uh, moving to the feature pack. And anyone who's actually on uh, classic components, well, we, we would encourage you, uh, but not require you to uh, move to the feature pack. So feature pack contains for the on the bottom side, it contains the the seven uh, components that we know from Vaadin seven and eight. Now, once again, if you are familiar with the Vaadin seven and eight API, you know that things like horizontal layout, uh, they have a number of methods that depend on other classes inside Vaadin seven and eight. Uh, here, just uh, showing you, there's layout events is one example. Alignment is another example. And here, margin info, these are just classes from Vaadin 7 and 8 that are being used by uh, the horizontal layout. So uh, classic components and also the feature pack, they do contain those uh, seven components, but it's almost 100 classes and interfaces uh, that are present that are supporting it. All right, that's what I wanted to say about uh, the feature pack. Uh, I think I can pass the word now to my colleague, Daniele, who's going to take us through the desktop Java. Thank you, Ben. Um, so in the next slide, we can see what we're going to cover. Um, so I have to dis give you a disclaimer that all of these topics could actually um, be discussed <laughs> in an entire uh, webinar just for themselves. There are um, many of those topics are are technically very complex, but I'm going to give you an overview of all of those um, that we actually solved in the feature pack. Uh, if you have a specific question, technically, that I'm not covering because not going too much in the details, um, then you can always ask a question. We're going to take we are going to take questions uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, so let's go in, on the next slide and let's um, make uh, an analysis on what the, what is the differences uh, that you usually encounter when moving from desktop to uh, web. So um, we are using the word Swing here uh, because Swing is the most common and famous framework uh, to develop a desktop application. Uh, but keep in mind that if you have another application that is a desktop application, then many of these concepts can actually be applied um, if you want to migrate. Uh, we, we focused on the Zwing API, so we are going to use this as a, as a reference, but the patterns are going to be the same even for other frameworks. Uh, so it's, it's very common um, for um, companies that need to move to web um, to find the push to do this move from a very, use, a very common uh, user request, which is, I want to open this application in a browser. The user call and say, I, I cannot use a browser. I can, I want to open this application in a tablet, things like that. And usually companies try to make that work. Um, focusing on this only objective, emulation uh, is very efficient because what emulation does is that they put your Swing application somewhere else. 
then they stream all of the changes that you make in the UI uh, to a canvas in the browser. And then the canvas um, intercepts all the interaction, the button clicks, the text inputs, and it goes back to the server. So it works exactly like a, a remote desktop. Um, this is a solution that actually solved the problem of this specific user, but creates many, many other problems. The first one is that you're, you're going to need a lot of resources server side uh, because your application is unscalable. Uh, desktop applications are made to be on the desktop. So if you have 10 users, the, the application must be instantiated 10 times. So uh, server side having that solution is going to be very demanding. Uh, and and a, a, another issue is that um, you will not be able to use all the web technologies that are available uh, for in, in normal web development. For example, responsiveness, uh, accessibility, styling, CSS. And it's going to actually be very hard to find uh, developers uh, that would work on that. You know, uh, people that actually studied uh, web development uh, are very hard to be compatible uh, with, desktop with desktop development. So you're going to be stuck in your old technology. You're just solving a problem with emulation. We are not going to do that. So this is a fully web-based um, application. You're, you're going to go away from Zwing or whatever technology you're going to use. You will be able to be extremely efficient server side um, because we are going to use web components, CSS, Flexbox for the layouting, component allocation. Uh, so you will remove completely uh, Zwing from your stack and you will be able to have a fully compliant develop app uh, web application following all the standards and security uh, requirements. So the, the difference here is fundamental and very deep. So after we got that on, um, after we define that, we can proceed to look at the four problem uh, in the next slides. So first of all, let's talk about the component and layouts. So uh, it, it's, it is very common uh, to have in a desktop uh, some components and layout. Um, for example, you have a famous uh, box, button, panel, which was very common in Zwing, or a frame uh, that allows you to have an MDA, which is having multiple windows open at the same time in your desktop. Uh, all of these uh, implementation are present in the feature pack. So you will be able to use these classes in Vadin that replicate, replicate, replicates exactly the behavior of the original Zwing application. Um, all of these are, are available in the feature pack. And in the next slide, we can actually see some example uh, here. Um, so in this video, we can see that we have those three buttons and you have a um, frame that can actually move and be responsive. Keep imagine all the pixel calculation of this responsiveness is happening uh, locally in your browser. So your browser is using CSS, it knows what to do, uh, but is able anyway to understand the Zwing contact, uh, constants. So uh, there in the example, you see a box layout that is exactly used like Zwing does and the components are moving. Same is for this card layout to replicate like a wizard, you know, uh, switching panels uh, with the buttons. Obviously there is always an edge case. So in the next slide, um, we ha we can talk about the edge cases because if you use desktop, if you use especially Zwing, you used pixels. Uh, it was very common uh, to put a button in, I don't know, 20 pixel right, uh, sorry, in the previous slide. Can you go in the previous slide uh, or the next slide? 43. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So it was very common to have these uh, pixels calculation and Zwing allowed you to implement your own layouting. Um, so in Zwing, you can extend the layout manager, which is an interface. In the layout manager, you put implementation on how your component should be arranged in the, uh, in, in the frame. Uh, the Zwing framework would actually invoke these methods and you will make your own pixel, pixel calculation in there. So anything could be possible. You could have made your own layout that is not present in Zwing. It's not present anywhere, it's just your own layout. And that is surely an edge case. Uh, but we managed to find a solution for this. Uh, so if you go in the next slide, uh, we provided uh, in the feature pack 
two classes. Uh, the first one is component geometry util, which provides uh, the preferred size, maximum, maximum size, location that you can use to put your components in specific areas of the uh, view. And you can, thanks to that, you can keep your uh, Zwing code exactly like it is, just changing uh, the API that you're using. And you can apply to the Vadin uh, view a custom layout, which takes as, as an input a layout manager implementation, which is exactly the, the same interfaces that you had in Zwing. So uh, if in, in the next slide, we can have an example of this. This comes from a very famous example that um, Zwing has uh, on how to implement your own layout. As, as, as we can see after Dragonfly applied uh, the changes, um, the get size from the parents now is uh, happening through this component geometry util. Uh, same for the set bounds and, and so on. And this interface uh, is called by Vadin, like Zwing did. And this will be able to allow you to use the exact same implementation you had for your layout in Vadin. So nothing could, uh, would change in your application. Uh, there is only one problem, obviously, which is this calculation is going to happen server side. So if you do this, uh, this calculation happens server side. So when you resize the application, it's not going to be the browser that does the calculation. It's going to be the server. Uh, so the responsiveness, obviously, here will lack um, a bit. But surely it's a good start uh, to move to web, um, keeping your exact same. In the next slide, we have some examples of this. Um, so uh, you can see here that we have um, uh, the normal uh, Zwing layout being used with all the um, um, constants offered by Zwing. All of them uh, happen locally. Uh, so the browser is using CSS Flexbox to rearrange the component uh, with the exception of the bottom left. Uh, which is a very complex pixel calculation. We wanted to make sure that even the most complex pixel calculation would work. And when you, and as you can see, um, in the other frame, everything is very responsive. So the CSS is recalculating everything at the runtime um, like that. Yes, exactly. But in the layout manager, uh, the recalculation happens when you finish the resize action because your browser needs to make a call. That's the only difference. So if you have a fixed size uh, view, nothing will change. All right, in the next slide, we can uh, start talking about another topic, which is the synchronous paint. This is a very common topic in the desktop um, applications. Uh, what, what, what you do is that uh, you, have a, in, you have a method. This method needs to ask uh, the user something. So in this case, enter username and then do something with it. Until the username uh, is um, wrong, it keeps stay, staying inside this cycle uh, until then is correct. Uh, this is very common in desktop. It doesn't work with web development. Uh, let's analyze why this doesn't work in web development. So in the next slide, we have another example. So we have a button. The button asks first for the first name, and then ask for the last name and then set a text, hello world name, last name. In Zwing, it happen, this happened that the button makes an event, then um, the event is gonna um, shift the control to the J option pane, which then shift the control to Zwing. So while you're waiting for the name, your thread actually became Zwing uh, drawing system. So Zwing is taking control of your thread. And when he has the value, it comes back to you. And then the last name, ask again, uh, what is the last name? Zwing draw as uh, everything because the control is then on, on, on the framework and then it goes back. Uh, so in a web development, the problem here is that um, the UI is not on your event, is an, is in another machine. There is an HTTP call in the middle. So um, in the next slide, we can see uh, that if we have the action listener, the browser, at the start is waiting for an answer. When you click a button, when you click the button and the browser is making a call, so the browser is loading. The browser will stop loading only when the event ends. So you cannot uh, ask anything to the user because the user will see changes in the UI only at the end of the event. 
So this is impossible to do in a web development. Um, in a web development, you have to make callbacks. So uh, in the second um, box here, we can see that the uh, web option pane is asking for the first name and immediately ending. This is the way to solve the problem in a callback. So in the next slide, we can see this better. Um, what's happening is that we are making three calls. Uh, we click the button one time, we send the name, we send the last name. Those are three calls in three different threads. And this is how web should work. So uh, how do we solve this? How do we allow people that move from Zwing to uh, Vadin um, being able to move without changing all of their business logic because they can ask the user a question in the middle of a very complex uh, business logic, even after nested and nested libraries invocations. So it's not always easy to make um, callbacks, to change to callbacks. Actually, it's very hard in, in many applications. So in the next slide, uh, we can see the, the blocking thread solution. So this was a very common solution that was not be uh, able to be applied before Java 21, but let's analyze why. So the problem, so the solution uh, is that the browser clicks and then the server immediately transfers the event control on a background thread and then returns immediately. Then the background thread is executing your event, then is pushing for a question, what is your name? And then when the name gets sent, the thread is waiting. It's just there waiting for the answer. Then when the name arrives, it keeps um, going on. Uh, it push again for the last name and then it waits. So with this background thread solution, the problem will be solved, but there are, there are downsides to this. Um, in the next slides, uh, we can see that first of all, uh, is gonna be very expensive because we have, you're gonna have many busy threads on the server. Um, and there is a limited number of threads that you can have on the server. Secondly, is very complex um, synchronization mechanism. It's very hard to trace, very hard to debug, very hard to implement. Many things can happen, many things can go wrong. And, uh, in, and, and the UI will be released. So in Zwing, when you open a model dialog, everything else is blocked. So if the Zwing is asking you a question in the option pane, you cannot click anywhere else. Uh, so either you get the string or the user cancels. But in a browser, you can do many things. You can just close the window. You can just go back forth. Um, so the inputs that you're gonna receive is, could be anything but a string. It could be a, really anything. Um, so in the feature pack, we solve all of these three problems. In, uh, so in the next slide, we can see that with Java Loom virtual threads, that is being introduced with Java 21, uh, the thread that is was actually um, killing your resources will not be present because the virtual thread can handle your event content without actually occupying a real uh, physical thread. So they're just data. And you can put code execution data inside uh, da a data structure in your RAM without being a thread. This is what Java Loom virtual threads allow you to do. And this will be very efficient using this technology. Uh, the complex synchronization mechanism is handled by the feature pack. So it comes out of the box. You don't have to do anything about it. And Vadin automatically handle the disposal of the server-side resources. So if you close the browser, Vadin will know because uh, Keep Alive will fail and we, it can just, or it can just disable everything else beside your click button. So Vadin will take care of all of this. So in the next slide, we can see how that would change. Uh, we have the Zwing original code with the Vadin feature pack. As, as Ben said, it's very hard to see the difference. The difference are only three. Uh, the listener is moving the, the execution to the feature pack with the execution run. And then we used our feature pack to make the question to the user. Um, then we have another topic, uh, which is uh, in the next slide the desktop integration. So desktop integration usually had printers, access the window registry or do something with the drivers. Uh, how do we solve this? So in the next slide, we have something called Zwing Kit. So the Zwing Kit is a way to embed uh, Vadin and Zwing together. So there is an, um, the, the Zwing Kit is like a, an, an extension and a wrap around a Chromium implementation that is able to make Zwing and Vadin talk with each other. 
So it is possible that for that specific user that really needs to use the local printer and you need to really communicate with the driver, uh, you can tell the cast you can tell that user to instead of opening your validating application with Chrome, you can open with your Swing kit. And in that way, you can use Vadin, uh, sorry, you can use Swing code inside your Vadin application. And that Swing code would be transferred uh, to the container of the browser and you can access the registry. And you're not required to do this for all the users. You can just make an app your application work uh, in two modes. One, when you allow you to use the drivers and one when you don't. So you can do this based on use case. You can actually use this to move um, phased with a phased approach to uh, VADIN, having some uh, coexistence. Um, last, we have in the next slide, another topic, which are the static and singletons. So um, if you ever developed a desktop application, uh, you know how easy it is to just put the username in a static string and call it everywhere, you know, because they, you have only one user. Um, this doesn't work in a web development because that static string is actually accessed by all the users. In a web development, you have to create session context data and the session must be stored user-based. And this is very important uh, because the developer could make a mistake um, that yet that relates to security issues or even uh, data being uh, spilled outside the user context and go to, us, to other users. Uh, so we uh, solved this in the feature pack by um, wrapping and finding automatically, thanks to Dragonfly Analyzer and Transpiler, we can find all the uh, static invocation, filter out, for example, when there are just constants and when there are constants, they can stay the same, but where there are calculated fields like the username, they can automatically be put inside VADIN session and VADIN will take care of uh, cleaning up the session, restoring the session and things like that. Obviously there are always use cases uh, because in Swing you can even just create a class file and import it in your application. Uh, so this will cover most of the use cases, um, not all runtime, um, things that you could have done in your application. Um, and this is the overview of the four features we have introduced for desktop application, the feature pack. Hey, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Daniela, Ben. Um, we have now time for some questions and answers. Um, we have a few questions. Um, couple are related to the roadmap. Um, let's start with the one uh, asking about um, whether it is possible to, to basically uh, convert or migrate from struts or Spring MVC or JSP, JSF, whatever, uh, by using MTK. And if, if not doable today, is that something on, on the roadmap? Um, so, shall I take this one? Um, so, we do not have that yet. So, um, the modernization toolkit is, for the moment, is uh, only limited. Well, let's say the only libraries that it's covering, uh, and for which we have implementations in Dragonfly, it's going to be uh, Swing and things related to Swing, like AWT, JGoodies, or NetBeans, and it's uh, Vaden Seven and uh, Vaden Eight. Uh, so those are the only technologies for which we have uh, Dragonfly rules and also feature pack uh, components uh, implemented. If you've got Java, though, you can use the analyzer to help analyze uh, these applications that you were talking about. So uh, by all means, uh, see if there's something that you can achieve with the, with the free analyzer uh, that can get you uh, some information. Uh, but that's about as far as we are at the moment. As for our roadmap, our roadmap is probably going to be um, focused on uh, deepening our coverage of Vaden 7, Vaden 8, and Swing in the next uh, upcoming months. Uh, that looks like uh, what's been really earmarked there. Uh, we don't have uh, these other technologies that you've mentioned. We don't actually have them on our roadmap. 
Uh, certainly, if there was an organization with a large struts application and uh, they were asking us to do that, then yeah, we would be able to uh, yeah allocate some resources there uh, and and make that happen. But that would be more of a project than a uh, the the official product uh, roadmap. So um, by all means, use the analyzer, uh, and otherwise, yeah, um, I'd say contact Vaden. Uh, if uh, certainly if you have a large application, uh, we can see about how far we can get um, with uh, automating that. Sometimes very large applications uh, can be very easy to uh, uh, transfer. Uh, can can be very easy to transform. All you need to do is understand what the uh, what the dependencies are, what APIs you're using. Cool. And talking about Analyzer, so we, we just learned that one can use Analyzer either as an Eclipse plugin or through Maven. Um, how about Cradle uh, or IntelliJ? Well, for, for Gradle, I would say uh, it's great to use uh, Eclipse. So you can import, uh, I mean, there's plugins in Eclipse that allow you to import Gradle projects. Uh, I would certainly try uh, the Eclipse route. Um, as for IntelliJ, we have had one eager community member um, make an adaptation for the analyzer in IntelliJ, uh, but we haven't actually made this part of the official product yet. Uh, if this is something that you're interested in, maybe we could uh, have a talk about that. Uh, but otherwise, the defaults would be uh, certainly Maven, and then if Maven doesn't work, then yeah, Eclipse till now has been um, the the thing that's worked in ninety nine percent of the cases uh, of all the applications that we've seen. So um, there's a pretty high chance that it would work with Eclipse, or that we could get it to work. Nice. Um... Then we got one question regarding um, MTK and uh, in which subscription it is included. Uh, right. Um, so uh, MTK, this we well we we actually have an interesting moment now. Uh, I believe if you go to Vaden.com and you look at our pricing page, I, I'm going to go myself because I don't want to say something that's uh, incorrect. Vaden.com. You're 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 not sharing your screen, Ben. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on purpose? Doing that on purpose, yeah. Okay, so if I go to vaden.com slash pricing, then I see uh, everything that's available and the different tiers that are available. So I see there's a plus, there's a pro, there's a premium, and there's an ultimate. So uh, the modernization toolkit, actually, it's written there. Uh, it's included in premium, but you can also get it for ultimate. So premium or ultimate, uh, this is where the modernization toolkit is, is included. There we go. And analyzer, free for all. Free for all, absolutely, yes. Yes, excellent. Um, then we've got a question regarding feature packs. Is, is feature pack just a library to add to the Vaadin app? Yes, it is just a library. Um, okay. You can use the library if you get the MTK subscription, then the library is available. You can just import it as a dependency. Yep. Okay. And it's it's a library that your application is using. So it's not interfering with your application or it's not emulating anything or standing in the way between your code and the Vaadin runtime. So your code is using Vaadin and the, the library is there for you to use as well. So if uh, you've got regular Vaadin that you want to use uh, or that you want to integrate with your modernized application, you can absolutely do that. So uh, you use it as you want it. And if you don't want to use it, then you don't have to. Excellent. Question related to Vardin 7 and Vardin 8 applications with the Valauti theme. Um, does the conversion tool, uh, is, it, is it able to convert these themes to, to new 23, 24 theme of Vardin? Can themes be transformed into, into the latest? So um, Dragonfly can change Java applications. So if you've got in your Java application, in your Java sources, if you're referring to the, uh, the Valo theme constants that are available in the Vaadin 8 or the Vaadin 7 
Java API. If you're referring to those constants and you're using the, uh, the set uh, style name or the add style name, and then you're using those uh, constants uh, together with that, then uh, yes, it's possible uh, to do that. Uh, so one thing you need to bear in mind, though, is that uh, there won't be necessary uh, because the the theme has changed. There isn't going to be a guaranteed visual equivalency of these things. So, for example, something like a button tertiary or a button link style that you might find in uh, Valo uh, that might not correspond to anything uh, that looks the same way in uh, Lumo. Uh, so mm -hmm. you might not find any visual equivalent, but uh, if there can be, if you can make a mapping between uh, what's in uh, Valo to Lumo, then then that can be uh, automated. Cool. Yeah, keep keep in mind that uh, we introduce a tool called Copilot uh, that is not about migration itself, but it makes very easy to edit the CSS of an application. So personally, I would try to focus on the function on the function uh, first, have the application work, and then with, thanks to Copilot, try uh, to fix the CSS uh, afterwards. Um, but yes, this is outside the modernization uh, automation concept. Yeah, but I, I think that that was a really good idea. Uh, I mean, first you'll get the, the functionality right, and once everything is working functionally, then you'll start to think about how to make it visually uh, more fresh or to to match whatever you want it to be cool um the last question this is not directly related to to the mtk uh, but it's more concerning applications um what's what's our take what how, how does one create mobile applications using Bodin? um or or how how does it work do we have anything that supports ios or android um not sure, but maybe related something to to um, uh, electron and and similar stuff. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah. So uh, we are not the right person to ask this because uh, we are we don't know the exact roadmap of the product. Uh, but I can tell you that um, in, if we don't want to make the specific uh, button on the Play Store or the Apple um, Store, you know, just having the icon, um, but having a application web application that is usable from a, from a, a mobile then we totally support that uh, it is possible to use the responsiveness uh, hooks to make the application look like um, designed for um, a mobile screen so it is it's, it's possible to render that in a browser that is inside a mobile but it's not a app specifically it's not a native app yeah yes Cool. All right, gentlemen. Um, that was all we had in the questions at the moment. For the audience, in case you have some, some further questions or, or you, you want to raise some, some other uh, discussions, feel free to do so on our forum, uh, vadin.com slash forum. Uh, a great resource for all kinds of conversations and, and discussions. Any questions regarding Vadin? Uh, we are definitely happy to help you. And uh, before we actually uh, close, I wanted to remind you all that we do have an upcoming webinar on this same topic on, on modernization toolkits. Um, as Ben mentioned, uh, this time or the next time, it will be more geared towards the human aspects uh, now that we have covered all the dev aspects. So uh, really happy to see you in, in that upcoming webinar. And um, yeah, let's let's continue the conversation on the forum. Ben, Daniela, any any last words from you guys? Seems uh, we are good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Have a great day.